Um, so last week, what we talked about was volume control versus pressure control. Okay. So machines have two choices. The machine, um, really controls everything through measuring pressure, time, and flow. Okay. That's all it's measuring. I think. Yes, probably. Um, pressure, time, and flow. Um, and so the machine can decide when it gives a breath, am I going to give this breath until as I'm pushing the air in, I reach a certain amount of pressure and stay there? Or do I give this breath at a certain flow for a certain time to give you a volume? Okay. So for example, if you are letting air out of the machine at a speed of half a liter per second, Okay, how much air will go into the patient in one second? Half a liter, which is so half a liter per second, and you're giving air for one second. I'm making the math really easy here. How much air are we giving? Half a liter, right? If we are traveling 50 kilometers an hour and we travel for one hour, how many kilometers have I done? 50, assuming I'm not on Kenyan roads with speed bumps every three kilometers that make me slow down, right? So that is what the machine does. It either targets a volume or it targets a pressure, okay? And so how the breath is delivered varies de depending if you are giving a volume breath or a pressure breath. That is what we talked about last week. Sawa? See, you didn't have to show up last week. I just summarized in three minutes, but you're already scratching your head. So don't worry. We will continue to review. So we want to go through a case together. You've got Mr. MN. It's Monday morning and you are needing to pre-round. And you look at bed two and he's on a vent. And he came in overnight. The call team is missing. Karibu, don't forget a muffin. It'll keep you awake. He's on the ventilator. You're the intern who was on nights got called away for an emergency and you're looking at the vent going, okay, I need to, you need to present this patient on rounds, right? So the first thing we should do is say what, what mode the patient is on. Okay. So you read the little top corner of this machine and it says SIMV volume control plus pressure support. Anybody know what that means? All right, so let's stop talking about how to present them and pause, okay? And let's talk about how, what does it mean to say SIMV volume control with pressure support. So all of, we have AC mode, we have SIMV mode, we have pressure support mode. Help is not a mode, help is what's going through your head when you hear all these words. So they talk about the timing and type of breath given for that breathing for the breathing cycle, okay? Not, no, not the breathing cycle, to the patient over time. What kind of breath are we going to give? Are we gonna give a full breath or a partial breath or a lazy breath? Um, so in AC mode, you can give a volume breath or a pressure breath, okay? They differ on what type of breath is given when. All right, so assist control on our machines includes volume control, pressure control, or PRVC. We have not talked about PRVC yet, so I'm putting it here. So if you are looking at these slides in three weeks and going, oh yeah, PRVC, now I know what that is. But on our machines, when it says volume control, it means AC volume control or AC pressure control or AC PRVC. And I'm gonna explain AC in a minute, okay? We have SIMV, which stands for Synchronized Intermittent Mandatory Ventilation. And you can have SIMV volume control SIMV pressure control or SIMV PRVC. And we can add pressure support, okay? You guys confused? I, I'm expecting you to be slightly confused because I gave you a whole bunch of words and explained none of them. Yes? So this is where I've gotten excited because I am going to introduce you to my new team. All right, this is Mrs. AC. She is strong, she is capable, she is super helpful. 
She is what you want when nothing else is working, okay? Do you see that? Look how strong and capable she is. Yes? That's Mrs. AC. So AC is assist control. On assist control mode, it does not matter whether the patient starts a breath or it's time for the machine to give a breath. AC comes through. AC does the work and AC gives you a full breath. All right? Are you liking Mrs. AC? Right? She is the way to go. So the machine will do all the work. The patient just has to start to trigger a breath and the machine goes, okay, here you go. Full breath. Done. All right? All the breaths on the machine are going to look similar because every breath, while started by the patient or started by the machine, is going to be a full breath. Whether volume or pressure, whatever you've set, Mrs. AC is going to take it all the way for you. All right? So this mode is really good for sick patients who need full support, right? We put patients on a ventilator to let them rest, right? We say that, right? To relieve their work of breathing. Mrs. AC, she does that for you. Sawa, you guys liking Mrs. AC? Are you liking my personification of the ventilator modes? Because this is my new way and I like it. The nice thing about Mrs. AC is everything is the same. So if you're the patient on the other side, you don't have to go, um, am I getting a full breath? Am I getting a little breath? I don't know. No, all the way through. Every breath feels the same. So it's comfortable. You know what the machine is gonna do. All right, so this is what AC will look like on a ventilator, because I took this picture this morning. And we're on, see how it says in the top right corner, volume control, that is AC volume control. Okay, if it doesn't say SIMV, it means AC, sort of. So notice how every breath looks the same. We have set a volume and we are getting that volume, 419 and 420, that's pretty much identical. So uh, every breath looks the same. You see that? That is AC mode, strong, capable, helpful. All right, now we got SIMV. This is SIMV dude. He's kind of lazy. Does, just does the bare minimum of what you tell him to do. All right, he's sitting there, he's distracted, he's playing on his phone. He's like that teenager who you tell to wash the dishes and he takes the five dishes in the sink and washes them and does not turn around and look for anywhere else he can help. He just does bare minimum, all right? Isn't this great? So SIMV stands for Synchronized Intermittent Mandatory Ventilation, okay? So the thing is, people hear synchronized and think, oh, this mode is synchronized, it's better. No, 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 no. It's synchronized because it's so lazy that when it does help out, it at least tries to time it with what you're already doing so it does less work, okay? So in SIMV mode, we set a rate. So maybe the rate is set at 12, okay? If the patient is gonna breathe more than 12, SIMV says, fine, you can breathe more. You just gotta do it on your own. I just was told to give 12, I'm done. Sawa? Does that make sense? I love this new way of teaching, I'm, I'm excited. So problems with SIMV is if you're the patient on the other end, you don't know if he's gonna help you or not, right? You go to take a breath, is SIMV gonna give me air? I don't know, he's lazy. Do I have to do the work? Is the machine doing the work? It's confusing for the patient, okay? The advantage of this mode when it came out, it was thought of, okay, we need to get patients off the machines eventually, right? So if I put them on SIMV mode and I set the rate to 16 on day one, and then day two, I set the rate to 14. And then day three, I set the rate to 12. And then day four, I set the rate to 10. And day eight, I set the rate to eight. Eventually, I will be at zero. And eventually, I can take the patient off the machine. Eventually. It takes a really long time. Um, SIMV does work well for kids, and I will explain why another day, okay? but. Are you guys getting this picture of this SIMV or only kind of does the bare minimum? Makes the patient do the rest. So this is what SIMV looks like on a patient, right? So you can see, do 
Do all the waveforms look the same or different? Right? So we've got low pressure, high pressure, high pressure, low pressure, high pressure, right? High volume, low volume, high volume, high volume, low volume. Do you see that? So our rate on this patient is set to 16. He's breathing at 29, right? He's allowed to breathe more. Just like on AC, he was still, on AC he was also, this is back on AC, he was also breathing 29, but they all were helped, right? Because AC is strong, AC is capable, AC, she is helpful. Mr. Dude SIMV is lazy. He's only helping out these 16 breaths. Anything beyond that? Sorry, you're on your own. So that's the synchronized part of how does it pick it, each one. So if this rate was 15, it would make sure in every four second window, it gives a mandatory breath, okay? So what's interesting is if your patient is paralyzed and breathing on their own, does SIMV or AC look different or would they look the same? SIMV says I'm only giving my set rate. I'm giving my rate of 16, that's it. But if you're paralyzed, how many breaths are you getting? Only what the machine is sending, right? So if you're on AC mode, you're still getting your AC mode and SIMV is going to look identical if your patient is not breathing on their own, okay? Does that make sense? It's those extra breaths beyond the set rate that it makes a difference. Have I lost you or so far so good? Pretty good? All right. So SIMV's got a little brother. His name's Pressure Support. Pressure Support, he's that little kid. He just wants to help. You guys know that little brother? Maybe you have that little brother. You just want to tell him to shut up sometime. No. <sighs> right? So Pressure Support is always happy to help. They're going to do all they can to help. The problem is they're small. They can only do so much. They, they can partner with you, right? They can stand there with you and help you out. But the patient has to do a fair bit of work, okay? So pressure support says, once you start a breath, I'm going to help you. You have to start it, but I'm going to help you, okay? And so once the patient starts a breath, pressure support is going to give a boost of air to try to get your breath in. Sawa? So there is no set rate. So if you have a patient paralyzed on pressure support, what's going to happen? <laughs> They're going to die. <laughs> Probably not because our machines are smart. And if your patient doesn't breathe for 20 to 30 seconds, it'll beep at you and say apnea and switch to a backup mode. Okay? But our older machines don't do that. They just beep on, at you and let the patient die. That's that one old, old machine that was in HDU bed for the last few weeks. That one will just beep at you if the patient stops breathing. Um, because pressure support has no set rate. He's trying to help, but he can only do so much. All right? So pressure support is great for weaning, okay? Because the work of breathing is shared between the patient and the machine, all right? The patient starts a breath and pressure support comes alongside and gives them a push. So you can, the thing that confuses or causes trouble on pressure support is the level of pressure support. So we can set our pressure support level really high. You can set it to 16 or 18. That's a lot of pressure. Karibu muffin. And so if you're given a pressure of 15 or 18, that's a lot. That patient is the machine. The patient may be starting the breath, but the machine is doing most of the lifting, okay? If the pressure support is five, that machine's just doing a little bit of lifting and the machine's doing, and the patient's doing most of it, okay? So if your pressure support is five or six and your patient looks good, maybe you can extubate. If your pressure support of six, is 16, don't extubate, all right? Okay, so sometimes siblings team up, yes? You get together, cause trouble together. That is what happens when we do SIMV with pressure support. All right, so you've got lazy SIMV there. He's saying, you've told me to give a rate of 15 or 10 or whatever we've set, that's all I'm doing. But 
Little brother pressures a little sister. Sorry, she's a girl. <laughs> little sister pressure support comes along and goes, no, 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 I can help for the extra ones. Okay, so you've got your rate of 12 or 15 and your patient is breathing at 30. What happens is the machine will give a little boost of pressure for those spontaneous breaths, okay? So the patient's not completely on their own because SIMV is lazy, because pressure support comes along to help. Sawa? Mode to make sense? You like my ventilator family? Eh. So what you see here, every time you see a purple line, and there's an invisible purple line right here, is the patient initiating a breath, okay? This patient wants to breathe at a rate of 29. So what the machine is doing is it's doing, because we're on a rate of 16, it's doing almost every other breath. We call them mandatory breaths. When it, Dude, SIMV finally does his job and helps out. We call that a mandatory breath, okay? And so we see that here with these higher pressure waveforms and square flow waveforms. Those are, the patient triggered the breath, okay? But SIMV, the machine noticed and said, you know what, we are due for a mandatory breath, okay? Because it's synchronized, it's not gonna wait for the, I don't know, 3.9 seconds to exactly elapse and then give a breath, okay? Because it's gonna synchronize with what's already happening. So it does kind of a timing window. So it kind of says, maybe it said, okay, here, next breath that starts, I'm gonna make a mandatory breath. And if that breath didn't start by here, the machine will say, okay, now I'm giving you a breath. So it's not gonna say your rate is 16 and let you be apnea for 40 seconds and then go 16 breaths, go. <laughs> it's making sure they take place in, so if your rate is 10, it's gonna make sure about every six seconds you get a breath, okay? If you trigger it at four seconds, it's gonna say, okay, that's it for this window. They call, talk about SIMV windows. And every ventilator has a different way of setting up how they do their windows, but. If, exactly. You won't see the purple line. You'll see that breath going in. I don't know. On my AC, guys. Yeah, so even on the AC, right, he's triggering every breath, but they're all the same. Because Mrs. AC, she's helpful all the way. Sawa? All right, so we were talking about our case, right? We got distracted by, we have no idea what the modes mean. So let's go back to our case and talk about Mr. MN, we're on rounds, and we need to present this patient and not have our consultant think we're stupid, okay? So start with the mode. The mode is always written on our machines on this top corner, okay? And just read the whole name out. Sometimes people feel like this part in the brackets doesn't matter. It matters. Because the options are, S. if it's SIMV, it's going to be SIMV volume control or SIMV pressure control. We always have pressure support added. You can set it to zero if you want, but then it'll still say with pressure support, okay? So it's more important to read the top line than the top line and the bottom line. If you're trying to be efficient and do, you know, neural rounds, which have to be done in negative three minutes, I don't know. <laughs> Sawa? So start there. And then the bottom of the screen is what tells us our settings, okay? These are not all of our settings. There are more settings if you hit the mode button. It'll give you more settings, okay? But these are the ones that we care about the most, okay? So FiO2, 35, okay? That's easy, read it off. PEEP, six, read it off, all right? Rate, it's helpful to say the set rate and the actual rate. All right, so you're gonna say patient is breathing at a rate of 16 
or no, patient's rate is set at 16, but breathing at a rate of 29, right? Sometimes you're going to say they're set at a rate of 16 and they're breathing at 16. But if on those 16s you see these purple lines, that means the patient's initiating. And so you can be really keen and say patient is set at a rate of 16, breathing at 16, but triggering the breaths. And then you're, then you get a good, you know, big smiley face in my book. Anyway, right? Because I want to know if the patient is breathing on, able to trigger the vent. Or if you see no purple lines, patient set at a rate of 16 and not breathing above and not triggering, right? Then we have to figure out why. Is it because the patient is brain dead? Possibly. Is it because the patient doesn't need to breathe at 16 and really wants to breathe at 12? Possibly, right? We don't know until we look more. So that's why it's helpful to realize set rate, actual rate, triggering, not triggering. Sala? All right, tidal volume set is 420. What is our actual tidal volume? So we have inhaled and exhaled. We usually read the inhaled. What's interesting about the timing of when I took this picture, it is has the exhaled volume of a mandatory breath, which is a usually a bigger breath, and the inhaled volume of the spontaneous breath. So you actually see both, right? But on our spontaneous breath on this patient, we're only getting 277, or you can round it to 280. All right? So that's important to know. And we'll talk about why in a minute. Then you also want to say, have we changed anything? You can say, when I came in, the FiO2 was 70, and I brought it down to 35, right? When I came, we were on pressure support, and his respiratory rate was 50, so I put him on SIMD. We want to look at the acid base status. Have we done an ABG? We don't need an ABG on every vented patient all the time, okay? But if you are unsure of their acid base status, it's good to do one. And we're going to talk more about acid base and blood gases throughout the next few weeks. Sawa? So, it's also, they are expensive. They're 1,500 to 2,000 shillings, so they add up, right? So if we need one, we need one. But to just say, oh, I'm curious, and it's been talking about ventilators, I wonder what the blood gas is. I'm not paying that bill, so, <laughs> right? Um, yes. So I would do a blood gas if someone is um, to Kipnik, and I don't know why. Is it because they have a metabolic acidosis that I don't know about? Um, I do it less based on their tidal volume. I'm not, I don't do a blood, like these volumes don't tell me yes, do a blood gas or no, don't. Um, if I don't, so if they're tachypnic, I don't know why. If the patient is really sick, if they are septic, if they are ARDS, if like makes patient that I just put on a vent, they have a blood gas for her before we put on a vent. I wanted to know, and I was guessing, because I didn't think we had a blood gas back. When I'm putting on the vent, I said, I bet you the bicarb's going to be low. No, I said, I bet you they were going to be acidotic. And you guys told me no, but the bicarb was low, so I was sort of right. Right? So you kind of know where you're at. Um, sometimes people like to do a blood gas for oxygenation. If you have a good SpO2 and your SATs are picking up well, don't do a blood gas for oxygenation. If you don't know what the saturations are, if they're not picking up, then you might want a blood gas. Um, it's hard because when you read books and look at different things, they will tell you, do a blood gas. The patient blinked wrong, do a blood gas. The patient moved, do a blood gas. Um, and in Canada where I trained and worked, we were doing blood gases on all our ICU every, patients every four hours. But then we decided it was too much and we went to every six hours. Now they've decided we can do it every eight. So it's interesting to see and that decision was made because we don't need that many blood gases on most of our patients. Um, so yeah, if you're questioning metabolic acidosis, if you don't know what's going on, um, if they're difficult to ventilate, it's good to get a blood gas. Yeah. 
But if it's like your OPP patient who's just unconscious, yeah, he's probably fine. So you want to know what your SpO2 is for rounds. You look really silly if you're standing presenting the patient and then the consultant puts a pulse ox on and it reads 50. Don't do that. Right? <laughs> um, secretions. Often if you ask about the secretions, the nurses will tell you what's going on in the mouth. I don't care what's going on in the mouth. I don't care. Well, I do a little bit, but not much. Okay. So when you ask, do they have a lot of secretions, clarify and ask about lung secretions. Are you suctioning the endotracheal tube for a little bit, a lot? What color is it? Is it thick? Is it thin? You know, all those good questions because that'll help tell you what's going on. What you find on your exam, when you listen, do I have bilateral air entry? Do I have sub-Q emphysema? You know, look at all those things. And then overall, are they getting better or worse? What do you think? Okay. Um, also, we want to look at our, sorry, I got distracted when we talked about volumes. We want to look at our pressure. Okay. This patient is on volume control. So depending on their lungs, they are going to possibly need a lot of pressure or a little bit of pressure to get the air in. Okay. Too much pressure causes barotrauma. It damages the lungs. How much pressure is too much pressure? Yeah, 35 and above, okay? And so we talk about this peak pressure or peak inspiratory pressure or PIP, okay? I like to call it peak. Um, our peak pressures on this patient are, what does they say? What if I tell you that's wrong? Why would that be wrong? Do we have one peak on this waveform or two different peaks? There's two different peaks, right? So it's, the machine is at this, you see where there's this gap? This is where it's currently measuring, currently at. And so it measures the last peak pressure. So during a pressure supported breath, right? Cause this is SIMV, this was a little pressure supported breath. I can tell you, I set my pressure support to five when I took this picture this morning. Five plus six equals that is what that peak is right now. So is that the peak I want to report on my rounds? No, you want to look and wait for the next breath and see. And if we look over here, I can tell you it was 22. All right. Because it was taking more pressure. So if your peak pressure is going up every day, is that a good thing or a bad thing? It's a bad thing, right? Your lungs are getting worse. Okay. So this is, if you go through this on rounds, you'll get most of what needs to be said about the respiratory. I'm not going to say all because somebody will find something that I forgot. Sawa? And then if you trend that every day, you can see is my patient, what's changed, what's going on. If you are doing a blood gas, always know what the settings are when you've done the blood gas and know if the patient was sedated or not, okay? And I'll explain why in a minute. So this patient, we did do a blood gas. We don't know why our respiratory rate is 29. We're not exactly sure what's going on. So blood gas was done. Here is our blood gas. Who wants to interpret this blood gas for me? You raised your hand. <laughs> Everyone else is scared to raise their hand. I don't know what I did. All right, so we are alkalotic. Why are we alkalotic? PCO2 is low. Is that adding to the acidosis? or alkalosis, or compensating for it? Or is it creating the alkalosis? Creating. So if the CO2 is creating the alkalosis, we have a respiratory alkalosis, then it's always good to look at the bicarb and see if the bicarb is 
Vicky Mielkalosis <laughs> is trying to compensate, or also alkalotic, making you a, giving you a double alkalosis. So what's this bicarb? Normal. So this this bicarb is lazy. It's not helping. It's not hurting. It's just there. So we are a uh, respiratory alkalosis. How's our PO2? Hi. Is there anything wrong with these, this patient's lungs? Maybe, but our PO2 is going really well, right? So we're respiratory alkalosis, and we have hyperoxia, which I spelled wrong. So why? Why do we have a respiratory alkalosis? What are some reasons for it? Hyperventilation. So how does a patient hyperventilate? What does it mean? They're either breathing fast or deep or both, okay? If they're breathing fast and shallow, they might not be hyperventilating, okay? Um, and it's really, really hard to assess on a spontaneously breathing patient if they're breathing shallow or deep, okay? Um, so, but this guy, is he breathing fast? What's his respiratory rate? All right. What's this number underneath, this 12.3 minute volume, right? So that's the total amount of air he's breathing in a minute. Why it's helpful to look at minute volume is if you try different modes or switch things around, your minute volume, right? Maybe we say, oh, I'm going to increase his volume and drop his rate and switch this and do a bunch of changes. If I come back and my minute volume is lower, what should happen to my blood gas? Your pH should go down. It should get better, right? Your CO2 will go back up, right? So what should we do with this patient? I've got to vote to reduce the rate. Okay, so what mode are we on? SIV. So we are right now getting two types of breaths, right? We're getting 16 breaths at a tidal volume of 420. And then another, I can't do math, 13 at um, a lesser tidal volume, right? So if we reduce the rate, theoretically, we're going to reduce the number of time he gets a large breath and he'll get a lot more smaller breaths, okay? All right, so we try that. You reduce the rate. What do you want to reduce it to? 12. Okay, so we reduce the rate to 12. So he now has 12 breaths at 420, and he increases his rate to 35. And your minute volume stays at 12.3. So we reduced the tidal volume. All right, I didn't give you guys a weight, but he's 60 kilos. So we're at seven mils per kilo. So what do you want to reduce the tidal volume to? 360. Okay, so we reduced the rate and he increases his rate to 40 and his minute volume goes up to 14. Change the mode. Why do you want to change the mode? Because we're talking about modes and Annette's not giving me a better answer. <laughs> <laughs> so why any guesses why this guy is I can tell you this is a neuro patient neuro patients are annoying <laughs> you agree <laughs> so so he's not storming though neuro people he's not storming he's just being annoying so so respiratory alkalosis can be caused by all sorts of things, okay? Maybe the patient next to him is hallucinating and screaming, okay? And it's agitating your patient and making your patient to Kipnik, okay? Maybe he's got a broken leg and the bone is sticking out and no one has given him any morphine, okay? Um, maybe you stuck a tube in his throat and he doesn't like it and he's mad at you, all right? All of those things can cause respiratory alkalosis. Another thing 
that can cause respiratory alkalosis is patient ventilator asynchrony. This patient is, goes to get a breath and how much air are they getting for a spontaneous volume? How much air are they getting? 277, okay. Do they want 277 or is that too small for them? So if you don't get enough air, what do you do? You breathe again. Right? So this patient, which sounds funny, is actually alkalotic because they're breathing too fast, because them and the ventilator are having a fight. They want more air from the machine, but they're not strong enough with that pressure support. Pressure support, little guy's trying to help, but he can't give enough volume as much as those SIMV breaths. Okay? So we switch this guy to AC mode. His spontaneous vol, there's no longer any spontaneous volumes, right? They're all the same. Sorry, that's a typo on here. All the volumes are now going to be 420, right? So now every time he gets a breath, he gets the whole full 420 and he goes, finally, much better. And so he reduces his rate to 18, which reduces his minute volume to eight. And his blood gas normalizes. Does that make sense? Right? Because he's feeling like he's getting the support when he needs it. He can breathe more efficiently. There's also less dead space and there's a whole other conversation there. But we've made him more comfortable. Okay? Any other thoughts we could do to make the patient more comfortable? Maybe sedation, all right? If you one moment were in a metatu and the next thing you know, you wake up in an ICU with a tube in your throat, a Foley catheter in, a line in your neck, you're tied to the bed, what are you gonna do? <laughs> right? What do you need someone to do? To restrain you and sedate you. Okay. Is that what you really want? Explain to me what's going on. Right? So they did a great study in the Netherlands. And I... Anyway, I don't have all the details. But they switched... Put ICU patients in two categories. One group got normal sedation, analgesia, etc. The other group had a caregiver, a trained caregiver, sitting at their bedside. And every time the patient wake, woke up, they said, it is okay, you are in the hospital, we are trying to help you, my name is Susan, I am working here at this hospital, you have a tube in your throat to help your breathing, you have a catheter in so you can just urinate, don't worry, don't stress, it's okay. And then these patients have head injuries, so five minutes later they wake up and the caregiver would do it again. And again. And again. Which group of patients had better outcomes? The ones that had it explained, okay? So explaining does not always work, but don't make reaching for your midazolam your first answer, okay? Sometimes we, we should. If our patients are in pain, right, we have a lot of traumas. We should make sure we are treating their pain, right? But having a tube put down your throat is not comfortable, so they might need something for that. But generally, the patients can be awake and be on a ventilator as well. Um, but talk to your patient. Try, try to figure out how to say in their mother tongue, it's okay, there's a tube in your throat, relax. I can do it in Swahili, I'm not there in Kipsugis yet. Tomo, tomo. <laughs> I just tell them to lay down and not bite. Ru, <laughs> matisus. So, does that make sense? So by making a patient more comfortable, we've taken this patient that was breathing fast, slightly agitated, we put them on a mode where the machine did more work and the patient was happier, all right? So whenever you have a patient on SIMV mode and you see this, high volume, low volume, high volume, low volume, that means your patient may not be doing a great job on SIMV, okay? 
How can we fix that? How can we fix that high volume, low volume, high volume, low volume problem? There's two ways. First, you can look at team SIMV dude and kid pressure support and say, you know what, kid pressure support, up your game, you're going to give more pressure. Okay? If we give higher pressure support, when I took this picture, I was mean to the patient and I gave them a pressure support of 5 to emphasize what was going on. When I made the pressure support 12, they were almost the same. Okay? So that's one way. Make sure your pressure support is adequate and double check. Always double check your pressure support. Last week I came in and the patient was on a pressure support of 35. And that's on top of our PEEP. So we were going to a pressure, a pressure of 40 with every pressure supported breath. Is that okay? No. So look, click here, look at the pressure support number, right? Normal is somewhere between 6 and 16. Is that what? Okay. So one option is increase your pressure support. What's your other option? What did we do? Switch the mode, right? Let's put them on nice AC mode. Let her take over. Let her do all the work, right? We have to get this patient off the ventilator someday, but it's not going to be today. So in the meantime, let's let the patient chill, right? Okay. So good. Your patient set it old on the vent. So now on AC, you're not going to repeat your blood gas because your minute volume has come down, so you're probably going to be okay. And then the nurses call you 999 and tell you, my computer's really slow right now. Your patient is desatting. They're 60. What do you do? Sats are 60. Increase the, okay, good. Increase that FiO2, crank it to 100, buy yourself some time. You increase the FiO2, the stats come to 60, 70. What do you do? Hmm? We want to increase the PEEP, possibly. But you go to the nurses and you say, what happened? And they say, I don't know, they were kind of moving around in bed, and then the stats were 60. They were 90. Right, so before you, Increase your PEEP or do all the things we want to make sure, A, your tube is in. Okay? So, we're going to go through uh, monomic. D is for displacement. How do you know if your tube is in or not? Okay, you call chest x-ray. They say we're busy. Auscultate, right? Listen to both lung fields. When you listen... If you have a patient who's spontaneously breathing and the tube is out, are you still going to hear air coming into the lungs? Yeah, yeah, right? If the tube is not, if their tube is in their esophagus, but they're breathing spontaneously, it's like they have a really big NG tube, right? <laughs> or I guess an OG tube. So what you want to do is listen and look at the ventilators, make sure the breaths time with the waves, okay? or put them on an ambu bag and squeeze as you hear, and listen on the stomach as well, okay? So displacement, you can displace out. The other thing to do is look at your measurement on your tube. The patient we just intubated three hours ago for OB, the tube is at 22 centimeters. I know that because I remember. I've asked them to do an x-ray. When they do that x-ray, I want to make sure that we're still at 22 centimeters, then if they call me now and say, I don't know if the tube's out and I find it at 16 centimeters, it's probably out. It might be like, right, you know, sitting at the edge, but I'm not doing stellar, okay? What if they call me and the tube's at 28? Where, and so I listen, it's at 28, I have no error entry on the left, lots of error on the right. We've intubated the right main stem, right? So... We're not great at charging tube depths. We need to get better at it. Or you just have to memorize all your patients' tube depths, okay? So displacement, right? Listen to the lungs. Make sure you're okay. What else do we need to do? So we listen. Air entry sounds fine. Both sides. Tubes at 22. What do we do next? Suction. Okay, what does suctioning do? It, ch it helps us check for two things. 
It clears out any secretions. It also confirms for you whether or not our tube is obstructed. All right. So you put that suction catheter down and it goes all the way down. Is our tube obstructed? No. You put, if you put that catheter down and there's the nice, the new um, inline catheters, those closed suction catheters have markings on them. So you should be able to line up the little 24 marking with the 24 line on the tube and make sure you're going deep enough, okay? If you can't, if your 24 mark is outside and it can't go any further, your tube is probably, your tube's blocked, what should you do? You can quickly try to instill and suction and get it out. If that doesn't work, take that tube out. That tube is making things worse, not better, okay? It doesn't matter if you're a good intubator or a bad intubator, take this tube out and start to bag by mask and prepare to reintubate. Because right now, the only path that this patient has to breathe is closed, okay? So, but this patient, we're able to suction easily. Next step. Any guesses what else we look for? We, we spelled dough. Any idea what we're trying to spell? Ah, someone knows dope. P, pneumothorax. All right, so you listen again and you realize, you know what, actually my air entry ain't as good on the right side as it was on the left side. And I can feel some weird, funny crackles here. What does this patient have? Okay, and then you look at the trachea and you see it's pushed over here. What should we do? Well, you know, a chest tube, how long does it take to set up for a chest tube? Right, this patient probably has a tension pneumothorax. Don't know why, bad luck. Stick a needle in, okay? I'm glad none of you said x-ray because there should never be an x-ray of a tension pneumothorax. Have I seen x-rays of tension pneumothoraxes? Yes, it happens, okay? But if you start to have a deteriorating patient and you've got all the signs, any, there's one more letter in this monomic that spells dope. Any idea what the last letter is? Equipment. Take the patient off and beg, okay? See if that helps. Um, put the vent on a test lung. I can tell you most of the time I'm told the patient is desatting because the ventilator is broken. Since we've gotten the new vents that we have now, the problem is not my ventilator, okay? The problem is the patient. So uh, before when we had old machines that were heavy heavy, it was 50-50. Um, but equipment is a rare problem these days, okay? So if you do all of that and your patient is still hyped, none of these, these are your emergencies. If any of these are happening, you want to respond quickly, okay? These are the ones I want you to try to do before you call me out of bed because they don't have time for me to put my clothes on and grab my mask and look for my name tag and run up the hill, okay? If your tube is out, Fix it. If it's obstructed, put a new one in. You can take it out and call me and say, I need help intubating. That's allowed, right? If you're begging, then you can say, hey, the ventilator is not working because the sats are way better than I beg when I beg. Um, but these are what you need to do quickly. If the patient is still hypoxic, what do you do? Now you want to work them up. Can we do an x-ray, right? See what's going on. We might need to increase the peep, right? look at other things. We need, it, this was sudden, so we have to consider a PE, right? Then your differential grows, Sawa? But do dope first as you're looking for the other things. All right. Um, I'm going to show you my ventilator a minute. Hold on. Maybe if it'll open. So, Here's my ventilator. So, on this mode, maybe you looked quickly. What mode do you think we're on? SIMB, why? Why are we on SIMB? So this machine is a little bit different. These little purple meanies, still purple, 
people like purple. A little purple triangle is the patient triggering, patient initiating a breath, okay? So we are set at a rate of 10, okay? On my funny machine, the settings are here and the patient values are here. I can't move the mouse or it'll hide what I'm trying to, it'll unhide what I'm trying to hide. So why are we SIMV mode? What do you, you guys are voting for SIMV or AC? All right, why are you voting for AC? AC or SIMV? All right, if we look at the top is the pressure waveform. And it is true, oh, I didn't give you a volume waveform, did I? All right, don't look at the corner. Oh, wait. Sorry, now we have a volume waveform too. All right, are we getting the same pressure every breath or a different pressure? Right, so which can happen, okay, in volume control. Your pressure may vary, but this is kind of consistent. We're getting a low pressure, high pressure, low pressure, high pressure. You see that? Volume, high volume, low volume, which correlates with our low pressure, right? Do you see that difference? So now what mode do you think we're on? Right? Yeah, so we have our SIMV breaths giving high pressure higher pressure and our full volume. And then we have our little pressure supportive breaths helping out. Does that make sense? So this patient is not doing too bad on SIMV. The volumes are a little bit different. We're set at 430 and most of the time it's a little bit less on our pressure supportive breaths, but not much, okay? So SIMV is not my favorite mode, but for this patient, I'm not gonna complain, okay? If we look, and he's doing this with a pressure support of five, what's going to happen to those spontaneous breaths if I reduce his pressure support? What do you think? We give him no pressure support. We send kid pressure support home because it's past his bedtime. He needs to go home. What, what will happen? His left career rate will probably increase. Why? Try to compensate for what? He's not getting supported, so he's not doing what? He's not getting enough tidal volume, right? And you can see that his tidal volume has come down for those small breaths to 200, right? And his rate did go up, Kidogo. Yes? Because we're not supporting him fully. Oops. Does that make sense? And then, oh look, even he's deep fatting. And then my machine fancy, it has a stat monitor. All right, so what happens if I go up on his pressure support? All right, we talked about this last week. What do you do when your ventilator's alarming? Intermission. Ventilator's alarming, what do you do? First thing, make the beeping stop. <laughs> okay? No, even the other day it was midnight and someone called me with questions and I could hear the vent beeping in the background and it was the old vent, which is a really annoying alarm. And he keeps asking me, and I'm like, just why is it alarming? Make that stop and then we'll deal with everything else. Because I can't think on my cell phone laying in my bed with this going on, okay? So make the beeping stop, then decide why, why it's beeping and fix it. So we were alarming low sats. We were desatting because our volumes weren't big enough, right? Okay, so now we've given more pressure support. And now the machine, the, um, 
we've actually slowed down our rate to what? We've actually slowed it down to 10, right? Because the patient was getting, the simulation is not perfect, okay? Computers try. This software also uses 90% of the processing power of my laptop, um, <laughs> which is why the slides were slow to advance. Um, but now um, you can see we have smaller pressure and higher pressure. The higher pressure now is actually probably your pressure supported breaths and your lower pressure is actually your spontaneous breaths, okay? So it can be switched. If your pressure support is set high, you might get more volume with the pressure supported breaths, okay? Did I confuse you? If that last line confused you, that's okay. All right, so just to show you how it's different, now we're just on normal. CMV is another word for AC, okay? The problem with ventilator modes is every um, company makes a mode, trademarks it, and then doesn't let another mode use the same name. So AC and CMV are the same thing. Um, now you can see how they're all the same, right? We're consistently getting the same pressure, right? Every breath looks the same, okay? Sawa? All right, Swali? About anything we did today? Minute volume. Okay, so right now, this patient's minute volume is ranging from 5.4 to 6 liters, okay? What is 512 times 11? What do you get? 512 times 11? So if we convert, so that's 5,632 milliliters. Converted to liters is? Which was pretty close to our minute volume when we did it. Okay, so minute volume is a total amount of air in a minute. If this patient increases their demand, I don't know if I can do or not. Maybe we'll see. And they breathe more, their minute volume will go up, right? If they start breathing at a rate of 20 and we're on AC mode, so the volume should stay the same, okay? The volume is set at 430. So if this patient breathes at a rate of 20, your minute volume is going to go up, okay? Um, and it might be slowly coming up. And so why it's, I like to look at minute volume is, let's say we do a blood gas right now, okay? Patient is breathing at, we've set a rate of 10, right? Patient is breathing at a rate of how much? 17, right? Their minute volume is 7.2, okay? So... We do a blood gas, and the blood gas has a pH of 7.36, a PCO2 of 44, a bicarb of 24, and our PO2 is 60. How's our blood gas? 7.36, CO2 I said was... Hmm? Four. Oh, make that 44, sorry. 7.36, CO2, 44. Bicarb, 24. It's normal, okay? So you do that blood gas and say, oh, good, we're normal. So what? Then the patient starts waking up, and the nurses decide to sedate him. Okay? So, and paralyze him. They give him pancuronium because they feel like it. So what happens now to our patient? Is he triggering the machine anymore? 
what's happened to our minute volume? Right, it, what was it before? 7.2, now we're down to? So, we're alarming. What do we do when we alarm? We silence the alarm, and then we decide, do we have a problem? Is the fact that his minute volume is three a problem? We just had a blood gas. He was normal, right? He's fine. Is he fine? He was fine with a minute volume of 7.2, right? With breathing seven liters a minute, he was able to keep his CO2 at a normal spot. Now he's sedated and paralyzed, all right? Yes, now that he's paralyzed, his body is probably producing a little bit less CO2, so we probably don't need it at exactly seven, right? But we're probably not ventilating him enough. So how do we fix this? Do we wait an hour for the pancreatium to wear off? No, what should we do? How can we bring this minute volume? If we say, you know what, seven, seven was, his blood gas was good on seven, we probably want to get to at least six, right? Now that he's paralyzed. How can I make this minute volume equal six? What can I do? Hmm? I can increase the tidal volume, or I can do what? Right? So, which one do we want to do? Often we increase the rate, okay? Because often we set the tidal volume based on their weight. And I look at his pressures, his pressure is 16. So if I tell you this guy is 70 kilos, how many mils per kilo are we on at 426? So you know what? I might say I'm gonna increase his volume, right? So, oh look, this machine measures CO2 continually and is telling me it's high. All right? Doo -doo. So, let's do, let's take his, vo rate, his volume up to 490, okay? Before, we were breathing at a rate of what to keep our minute volume at 7.2? Is it 18? 16? Right? But now that I've increased my volume, I don't have to go all the way to 16, right? You can do really easy, easy math. If, we, if our goal is six liters, what is 6,000 divided by 490? Twelve point two four. Okay, so that means I set my rate to 12 because respiratory therapists only like even numbers or multiples of five and 13 give us palpitations, okay? So now, do we expect our minute volume to change instantly or does it take a minute? It takes a minute. All right, so slowly coming up and I would expect it to get to about six, right? And that will hopefully keep our blood gas more normal until the paralytics wear off. So does that make sense for minute volume? So what I really like about minute volume is I can look at minute volume between modes. I can do a lot of changes, but I can still have that one value to go back to, okay? Maybe my patient was just on pressure support mode. They were breathing at a rate of 30 with a volume of 300, right? And I switch into something else and all of a sudden they slow their rate down to 12 and I think, ooh, am I still okay? I, and I had a blood gas or I know, knew they were okay. If my patient is awake and able to shake my hand, they're probably not hypercarbic, okay? So maybe they had with a CO2 or they, they had a good GCS with a minute volume of seven, right? And now I've changed it and their GCS has gone down and I realize my minute volume has gone down as well, I can think that maybe we're hypercarbic before looking at, before even doing a blood gas, okay? Good question. It's fun to get in the habit of guessing what your blood gas is gonna be before you do it. 
because it's just fun. And then if you're really good at it, you can do less blood gases. All right, Swali and Guinea. We'll talk about that next week. Uh, now you have to come back. <laughs> Wally and Guinea. All right, we will end there.